Hello, welcome to the Thursday, October 11th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Honolulu, Hawaii. WhatsApp fixed a critical vulnerability that was originally discovered by Natalie Silvanovich with Google's Project Zero. The vulnerability was triggered by a malformed RTP packet and would trigger a heap memory corruption, so code execution would certainly be possible. However, the proof of concept exploit released would just crash the application. To be affected by this vulnerability, a victim would have to accept a malicious call via WhatsApp and then the attacker would use a patch similar to the one provided with the proof of concept in order to inject these malformed RTP packets. So remote code execution may be possible. However, the current proof of concept exploit only triggers the denial of service. And Salesforce released another neat library to fingerprint encrypted connections. It's the hash library, I guess is how you pronounce it. H-A-S-S-H, and as the name sort of implies, it fingerprints SSH. The idea is similar to Salesforce's JA3 library that uh, they already open sourced a while ago. JA3 does profile SSL connections by looking at various artifacts in the SSL or TLS handshake. Now with the hash library, they essentially apply the same technique to the SSH handshake. SSH has a number of different options, different crypto algorithms are supported and the like. So essentially what it does is it looks at the handshake, calculates a fingerprint of the request coming in from the client and then gives you this fingerprint fingerprint that should identify specific client software. Now in my experience with JA3, the simplest way to use it is to use it as a plugin for a tool like Pro. And then you get a summary of all these fingerprints. You can look for anomalies there. You could also look for mismatches between the client identifier sent by a client and the fingerprint to see if maybe someone is lying about what client they are using. And Kaspersky released details regarding CVE 2018-8453. In case you don't remember this CVE, this was the already exploited in the wild vulnerability fixed by Microsoft this week. Now, Kaspersky originally came across this vulnerability as it was analyzing an exploit they found in the wild. It was part of a targeted attack that happened last year. And in this attack, a PDF was used originally in order to initiate the attack. The vulnerability itself is a use after free vulnerability. These vulnerabilities have of course been quite common in Windows in part because, well, I uh, guess the bad guys are running out of more simple vulnerabilities to exploit, but exploitation of use after free vulnerabilities has been somewhat standardized by now. And Kaspersky is sort of walking through the process, what exactly went wrong here and how this vulnerability was exploited. And Juniper released an update for several of its products today. Now, one particular interesting vulnerability here is an insecure SSH deconfiguration in Juniper's device manager. The problem here is that the SSH daemon configuration does allow users with no password to log in. The way this should be set is that as a user has no password, logins should be rejected. But in this case, well, all you need is the user's username. Now, this could be particularly devastating if you assume that this is set correctly and users with no passwords can't log in because sometimes I've seen it where administrators deliberately set up users without password to prevent a remote login. The fix, of course, is rather straightforward in that all it takes is fix the configuration file to no longer allow users with no passwords to log in. 
And remember when all of our data got lost by Equifax? Well, uh, one of the standard fixes in order to prevent this data from being abused was to ask for a credit freeze. If you set up a credit freeze, then you're being given a fairly long PIN number that you can use to later unfreeze your credit. From my experience, this PIN number is usually then sent in the mail, but looks like Experian had a website where you could request your PIN number. In order to request your PIN number, you needed the usual things that a hacker stole from you, like your name, address, and social security number. In addition, you needed the answer for a number of security questions, but apparently you didn't actually have to know the answer. All you had to answer was none of the above, and the result was that you didn't have to answer the security questions correctly. This process apparently has been fixed by now or Experian actually just turned off this feature on their website. If you do need your credit freeze pin now, you do actually need to ask for it through the mail. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Tomorrow may be a little bit an abbreviated podcast uh, because it's a travel day. So not 100% sure if I'll fit it in there. So in case I don't make it and don't record tomorrow, the next podcast will be on Monday. Thanks and bye.